This is the lecture for European history for Wednesday, the whatever the heck today is, 25th. 25th of May, 2022. And we started class with something cheerful, footage of kamikaze attacks against the American Pacific Fleet towards the end of World War II. We'll be talking about the kamikaze corps later, but there's nothing like seeing what actually happened. Fiction doesn't compare. So, where we left things was in the European theater of operations, Paris had been limited, li liberated, and American troops were headed towards the Rhine and towards Germany. Field Marshal Montgomery, the British commander under General Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander, uh, has an idea to go through an unlikely route to get into Germany. What we're going to do is cross a series of bridges in southern Holland. Those bridges will be seized simultaneously or as close to simultaneously as possible by airborne paratroopers. With the key being the bridge at Arnhem in Holland, bridge over the Rhine. Meanwhile, British 30 Corps, their tank army, will drive up a single highway to Arnhem, cross the river, and hit the Ruhr. Montgomery promises this in July, that if we do this, it will end the war by Christmas. But the Allies still have all of their stuff coming across the beaches of Normandy and through the single Mulberry Harbor that the British have. There is not enough supplies to supply the American forces to the south under General Patton and the British forces to the north under General Montgomery. So Eisenhower has to make a decision. He hates this sort of thing. Eisenhower was picked not because he's the best battlefield commander. Like George Washington, he was a mediocre to a good battlefield commander. His skill was political. The... English and the American people are uh, two nations divided by a common language. The problem with the Yanks, make sure your notes are out, are they're overpaid, they're oversexed, they're over here. That was the British statement about the American troops stationed in England. The British and the Americans are just enough alike to really get on each other's nerves and to preserve the alliance as a functional partnership requires incredible political skill, and Eisenhower has it. So, Eisenhower makes the call to support Montgomery's plan. This is Operation Market Garden. In September of 1944, a series of parachute drops are conducted along the route, and 30 Corps begins the attack. The problem is, even with all the transport aircraft we've been able to assemble, and gliders, which are much more dangerous than jumping out of a plane with a parachute, the um, Allies do not have enough aircraft to drop all the paratroopers simultaneously. The, the thing about um, paratroops is surprise is, is rather important to their success. So what happens is we drop about two-thirds to three-quarters of our paratroops, which tells the Germans exactly what we're going to do. Plus, the Germans do get a hold of our battle plans in a crashed glider. Once they know what we're going to do, the Germans just have to plug up the bridge at Nijmegen, south of Arnhem, and the bridge at Arnhem. At Arnhem, a small group of British, British paratroopers have actually taken the north end of the bridge, but they are isolated. They're cut off from the other paratroopers to the west, and they're cut off from the south by German Waffen-SS tank divisions. In other words, some of the most powerful units in the German army. Operation Market Garden turns out to be an operation that went after a bridge too far. Our forces get somewhat towards 
the Rhine, but we don't cross it. Meanwhile, the city of Antwerp is still in German hands, and Antwerp would be the best port for us to use. So this is a failure. Up until this point, the Allies saw the Germans on the run in France, and they believe that the war is this close to ending. But with the attack and the failure at Arnhem, we're in for a long slog, at least into 1945. After this, the attack on Antwerp is prioritized, the Nazis demolish the port, but eventually we start taking cargo into Antwerp, which will resupply the armies. Meanwhile, the American army engages in a battle near the Hurtgen Forest. And we are in an almost World War I style battle of attrition, where we throw troops in and they throw troops in and they annihilate one another, which is something we and the Germans have been trying to avoid. Autumn becomes winter. The last time the German army attacked in winter was during the time of Frederick the Great. Hitler's role model, a desperate German leader surrounded by an enemy alliance, looking for a miracle to save him. So of course, the Germans attack in winter time. For the second time, the German army attacks westward through the Ardennes. This is the same place they attacked through in 1940 to hit the French. But we don't expect it, because the Ardennes, even though the Germans already did it, seems too rumbly, rocky, foresty, hilly to be a good place for armored troops to move through. So what we have at the Ardennes are the troops resting up from heavy combat down here and up here, they go to rest here. So the Germans drive into southern Belgium through the Ardennes. An American parachute division, the 101st, is surrounded at a city called Baston. At Baston, the American troops hold out and they hold a crossroads, but the Germans move beyond them. New tanks, new formations, new weapons are used. But the most effective weapon are German Americans. Deutsche American Bundists. There was an American Nazi party before World War II, and when the war began, while the United States was neutral, which remember was a few years, many of these true believing Bundists, these German Americans from Cincinnati and elsewhere, Go to the fatherland to help out. Well, these troops are selected for special missions during the Battle of the Bulge, the Ardennes Offensive of 1944. They're dressed in captured American clothing. They have captured and fake American IDs. They are dressed as military police. <clears throat> and they're going to be secreted behind American lines because the goal of the Ardennes Offensive is to hurt the Americans, not the British, to bloody the Americans, to terrify them, to kill them. Because if you kill enough Americans, we'll go away. So when the attack happens, these fake military police misdirect reserves and they kill a number of our people from behind. It gets so bad that if American troops meet other American troops they don't recognize, they hold each other at gunpoint and ask who, who was the most valuable player in the World Series of 1938. Or who has the best legs of all the actresses in Hollywood. Of course, that's Betty Grable. Everyone knows that. <laughs> and if you were up on American pop culture, you were fine. But a lot of these Bundists weren't. Of course, if you were a nerd that didn't keep up with baseball stats or, or whatever, you're going to be locked up until somebody identifies you. But it does sow terror. It messes with us. 
And during this attack, the Malmody Massacre occurs. A number of, oh, I think about 200, 250 American uh, soldiers are captured, and they're brought to a field in Malmody and gunned down by the SS as an act of terror designed to deter Americans from fighting. However, the anal retentive German nature is exploited by the Allies here. Because so here you've got papers of American GIs. Does anyone notice anything off? Couple things. <laughs> the most obvious. Face. No, forget the face. Showing the face quickly. What did I write? No, I didn't write identification. I did wrote. I wrote identification. Oh, no. American oh. IDs had a purposeful misspelling. Which the Germans corrected <laughs> because they're so compulsive, they can't allow themselves to have a misspelled ID. So eventually, <laughs> we begin identifying the enemy by their false identification paper. No, no, they didn't have identification; they had identification papers. Sure, <laughs> capture them. The Battle of the Bulge. Uh, is called that because it creates a big bulge in the Allied lines, otherwise known as the salient. But because the paratroopers hold out, and because the Germans run out of fuel, it doesn't get where it wants to go, and General Patton attacks from the south and destroys it. So, during the next remaining winter months, we move up to the Rhine River. We haven't crossed it yet, but we've moved up. However, though Montgomery has a plan for a massive assault across the Lower Rhine, and though Patton is going to secretly, against orders, cross the Upper Rhine because he can, and because he's aggressive, and because he wants to beat the British, the American First Army, which is not under a hard charger like Pat, captures an intact bridge at a place called Remagen. The Germans are retreating across it. The orders are to blow all bridges across the Rhine, which they've done everywhere except at Remagen. But at Remagen, they wait too long. An unexpected American attack, attack captures the bridge before the Germans blow it, and our, our engineers cut the demolition charges from the electrical detonators that the Germans have. So we have an intact bridge over the Rhine, and even though it wasn't part of the plan, even though the British were supposed to cross and Patton was crossing, the American First Army actually does begin to set up a beachhead on the other side. Patton crosses from the south, Britain crosses in the north, and the attack on Germany proceeds. Ultimately, at Torgau on the Elbe, U.S. and Soviet troops meet up. And there are wonderful newsreels of the Americans and the Russians switching hats and hugging one another and drinking because the Soviets have vodka. Of course, they have vodka. We have chocolate. Of course, we have chocolate. So chocolate and vodka, good combination for combat soldiers. Um... And the war in the West comes to an end, as I told you, because we did that a little early, VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. For the Allies, it's May 8th, 1945. For the Soviets, it's May 9th. So Hitler has shot himself, and uh, Germany is split between the Russians and the Allies. Any questions on that before we shift to the Pacific? Okay. In the Pacific, there are attacks by the Allies along two lines uh, of attack. 
And I guess let's continue using this code. General MacArthur from Australia. The Guadalcanal has been won. And what General MacArthur is doing is he is moving up through New Guinea in a major land battle. And along the North New Guinea coast in preparation for an attack against the Philippines. This is the Southwest Pacific Command. Meanwhile, the U.S. Navy is moving up the Solomon's Islands towards Rabaul, the Japanese base in the region, but they don't take Rabaul. They surround it. General MacArthur's idea is try it at Rabaul. Hit them where they ain't. Land troops build airfields, let the Japanese stay in position, and starve. And that's what we do. Rabaul has a massive number of troops, and we never attack them. Same is true for their fleet base at Truck in the Caroline Islands. We go around it. The main Navy attack in 1943 is across the Central Pacific, through the Marshall Islands, the Gilbert Islands, towards the Marianas Islands, which they reach in 1944. Now, the forces involved. The U.S. Navy perfects aircraft carrier warfare with what is called a task force. Imagine concentric lines of protection, like in an old medieval castle. At the heart of the task force are, usually we have two or three aircraft carriers. We find that having our carriers together, surrounded by maximal force, gives them best protection. And around these aircraft carriers, which are floating airfields, that have planes that range out to a thousand miles or more, we have a line of battleships, or should I say a circle of battleships, of cruisers and of destroyers. Battleships are big gun platforms, cruisers are medium-sized gun platforms, destroyers are small gun platforms with torpedoes. And there are picket destroyers out beyond the edge of the defensive line. Japanese ships will be detected long before they get anywhere near our carriers and our battleships can form a line, go out and hit them if that's necessary. Japanese aircraft have to pass through whatever combat air patrol we have, through the line of pickets, which all have radar, and into the line of the defensive ring, where they're likely to get shot down and only a few get anywhere near the aircraft carriers, and they have point defense guns as well. So, rings of protection, rings of protection, rings of protection around the vital aircraft carriers. This form of warfare works. The Japanese are desperate for a decisive battle, but by 1943, the Americans have produced and are producing ridiculous numbers of warships, and our training facilities are producing ridiculous numbers of pilots and sailors, and the Japanese are being overwhelmed by numbers and by quality. Because their quality edge was lost at the Battle of Midway and in the battles around the Solomon Islands. Because their pilots did not leave the front lines with their skills to teach others their skills. Their pilots remained in the front lines and um, died with those skills before they had a, path, a chance to pass them on. Also, there's an attitude within the Japanese military about downed pilots. In the American military, we work very hard. We have submarines on patrol near every area of attack, so that if an aircraft goes down and the pilot survives with his May West vest, uh, an inflatable vest that keeps him afloat, um, a submarine and aircraft will be looking for him. The Japanese assume it's one's karma, and they are left to fate. In other words, a Japanese pilot that shot down over the ocean is very unlikely to be picked up by Japanese forces. So they have an ongoing drain of talent. The U.S. Navy specializes in aircraft carrier task forces. The U.S. Marine Corps in amphibious attacks. That is, approaching an island, hitting that island with naval gunfire and aircraft like we saw yesterday, and then landing on a hostile beach. Aside from a fighting retreat, probably the most difficult operation in modern war is landing an army on a hostile shore that's being defended. That's what the Marine Corps specialized in and is specializing in today. 
So we arrive in the area of the Marianas Islands, which includes the island of Guam, which is a U.S. territory, and the Northern Marianas, which is also a U.S. territory. And the main island is the island of Saipan. In June and July of 1944, American forces surround Saipan, and American Marines begin to land. Two things happen in Saipan. First, the Japanese Navy comes out to play with their new carriers and their new pilots. The battle that happens west of Saipan is called the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot because American aircraft have kill ratios of 10 to 20 to 1. What that means is the Japanese pilots are so inexperienced, they literally fly into the gun sights of our planes, and we shoot them down like a bunch of hunters shooting turkeys. With the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, Japanese naval air power is basically gone, although we can't be sure of that. Also on Saipan, for the first time, we encounter large numbers of Japanese civilians. Saipan has a significant civilian population, a few thousand women and children. I'm not going to show it, but you can see, if you want, an Israel footage of mothers holding their hands of their children with babies in their arms, walking off a 200-foot cliff one after the other after the other, rather than be captured by the gaijin, the round-eyed barbarians. The Japanese civilian population commits mass suicide, for the most part, rather than be captured. It is still incredibly rare to capture a Japanese soldier. Usually the only ones we capture are people who were basically stunned, and they wake up and they're in custody, and even then they try to kill themselves, and, and us. Now we come to the greatest, largest naval battle in human history. The island of Leyte is one of the central islands of the Philippines. And General MacArthur is going to be com uh, commanding the land attack, and Admiral Nimitz the naval attack. At Leyte Gulf, the last battleship on battleship battle occurs at night when a Japanese force attacks from the south to try to get to the beaches and destroy the supply ships, and an American battle line composed mostly of Pearl Harbor survivors, Pearl Harbor ships that had been sunk by the Japanese, refloated by the American fleet, modernized by the American fleet, they sink a Japanese battleship attack from the south. However, in the north, the Japanese have their major battleships, including super battleships, Yamato and Musashi. However, the American fleet commander, Admiral Halsey, who's known as Bull in the newspapers because of his aggression, has detected a decoy force of aircraft carriers to the north, and he has gone off northward <laughs> to hit that force with everything he's got, including his battleships. Everyone else thinks Halsey's left his battleships to block the northern approach to Leyte. Halsey has not. So the next morning, when Halsey's attacking a bunch of empty aircraft carriers, the Japanese battleships attack the small ships supporting the landings. They attack American destroyers, which are little tiny ships that are really good at anti-submarine warfare. And they attack American escort carriers, which are merchant vessels with small numbers of aircraft on board that are designed for ground attack. The destroyers fight like samurai, like almost suicidally. The aircraft carriers too. And then one of the miracles of history happens. The Japanese Admiral Ozawa, thinking that he somehow penetrated to the heart of the American fleet, misidentifying destroyers as battleships and escort carriers as fleet carriers, panics and says, oh my God, I'm about to be destroyed. I've been lured into a trap. And he orders the Japanese fleet at the moment of its victory to turn around and steam away. If he hadn't done that, 
we would have suffered a heavy, heavy defeat. Because he does that, our forces on Leyte continue to be supplied, and the battleships of the Japanese Navy that survive this get hit from the air as they retreat. Later the day that Ozawa retreats, for the first time we encounter the divine wind, Tami Kaze. In the 1200s, the Mongol Empire of Kublai Khan, which controlled Korea and had allies controlling all the way to Poland and Hungary, is going to invade Japan. The Mongols have an unprecedentedly large invasion fleet. They cross the Tsushima Strait, the Korea Strait, whatever you want to call it. They land in Japan, and as they're landing, they get hit with a typhoon, a super hurricane, a cyclonic storm that makes the hurricanes that hit the east coast of the United States seem like blowing out candles. The Mongol fleet and invading army is destroyed. The Japanese believe that the spirits of wind and wave have risen to defend the god emperor of Japan, Kamikaze, divine wind. Kublai Khan isn't done. He comes up with an even greater invasion force. A few years later, he lands that, and it gets hit also by a Kamikaze, by a typhoon, by a divine wind. And it is destroyed, and the Mongols that had landed in Japan are sliced and diced on by the samurai, medieval Japanese knights. What the true believing Japanese military leaders say is we need a new kamikaze today. But our divine wind will be made of human will and human flesh. The call is given. Looking for people willing to die for the Emperor. The Kamikaze Corps, much like the 9-11 terrorists, train in taking off and maneuvering their aircraft. Landing is less of a priority. Diving is a high priority. After a few weeks of training, they're put into uh, an obsolete aircraft filled with enough fuel for a one-way trip and a bunch of explosives. They take off. Not yet. The night before their attack, they have a special feast. The next morning, they drink sake, toast the emperor, write their death poem. They have already clipped their, toe, their fingernails and placed those fingernails in a sandalwood box, which is the only remains their family will have of them. They take off, form a massive formation called a kiku sweep, flying chrysanthemum, and fly out towards their targets, the American task forces, whereupon their destiny, their karma, their fate is to dive on the largest American warship they can find, preferably an aircraft carrier or a battleship, and die damaging those who would harm the God Emperor. Thousands of kamikaze are going to be made from late 44 until late, um, summer 45. Kamikaze are not just flying obsolete aircraft, escorted by good pilots who are not supposed to die today. Kamikaze also take the form of baka bombs. A baka bomb is a rocket-powered glider. It's from the Japanese expression baka yaru, which means crazy. So a person strips and straps into what is basically a cruise missile, is dropped from an aircraft, and flies the glider and activates the rocket engine on their terminal dive. They have a much bigger bomb than the improvised aircraft of the Kamikaze. Then there are the Kai Tain. Kai Tain are manned torpedoes. They're in a submarine. The kamikaze pilot gets into the kaitane, it's sealed off, it's separated from the submarine, puts up its uh, periscope inside the harbor, picks the biggest target he can find, and pilots this thing into the hull of the American warship, which hopefully would sink. The kamikaze are the first sign of the genuine nature of the Japanese people in World War II. 
purpose of the nation is to serve and protect the God Emperor without restraint at all costs. So as we move closer, as we move closer to Japan, from Saipan to Iwo Jima to Okinawa, which are all going to be bases for air attacks on Japan, as our aircraft carriers move off the coast of Japan, hit their cities. And our bombers fly from Okinawa and Saipan to hit their cities. More and more intense kamikaze action happens. Closer we get to Japan, the increasing death toll we face. Japanese will occasionally surrender. And when an American gets close, they shoot, pull a grenade, pin. It's to the point where the Marines have to exterminate units of Japanese with flamethrowers. We have tanks called the Ronson, which is an American Sherman tank, but instead of a main gun, it has a flamethrower. Because the Japanese won't surrender. Again and again and again, they prove that they will die soldiers and civilians. Once we take Okinawa, and actually during that battle, the greatest of the kamikazes, the super battleship Yamato, steams south from Japanese home islands with enough fuel for a one-way trip. The plan is for this super battleship to beach itself on the shores of Okinawa and die fighting the Americans. It is sunk hundreds of miles away by American aircraft. But it was a one-way trip. The slogan that the Japanese army begins to use is 100 million die gloriously together. The Japanese people at that time numbered 100 million. The theory since Midway has been if you kill enough Americans, we'll go away. Americans love their individuality, their decadent lifestyles, their luxury. If you kill enough Americans, they'll go away. Make it difficult for them to come closer to Japan. Kill Americans. Make it difficult for them. Fight for every scrap of ground. Hitler wanted soldiers like the Japanese, never got them. Not really. Because what Hitler wanted was armies willing to die fighting to deter the enemy from getting any closer. But Hitler wasn't a god. Hirohito, the emperor of Japan, was a god to these people. So, the defense of Japan is going to be a series of kamikaze attacks where the entire population of the nation will expend itself. That's the plan. Operation Olympic is the American plan to attack Kyushu, the southernmost island of Japan. Operation Downfall is the American plan to attack Honshu, the main Japanese island. We expect these two operations to result in at least one million dead. Not casualties. Casualties are dead, wounded, and missing at least one million dead. Millions of wounded and missing. Every Japanese hamlet, every Japanese mountain, every Japanese river cross defended to the death by an unyielding fanatical population. 100 million die together gloriously. That's what we expect. Now, There are Japanese civilian po uh, politicians who would like to surrender. They send messages through the Soviet government that they'd like to talk surrender, but our policy is unconditional surrender, and the Soviets are about to attack the Japanese, so they're not going to be good, uh, honest brokers anyway. But a number of the people who whinge and complain, Oh, we should never have dropped the atom bomb! Talk about these civilian population politicians 
as if they had the power to do anything. These are precisely the kind of politicians that the army had routinely assassinated from 1931 onward. The army knew about them. They were chattering. They were nowhere near to actually being able to do anything. In this context, President Roosevelt dies. The new American president, Harry Truman, a Midwestern haberdasher who became a machine politician, vice president, and then president, promised, I'll get the full quote, a rain of ruin from the air, the likes of which has never been seen on this earth. If the Japanese don't see reason and surrender. But reason has nothing to do with this. They are defending their islands. They are defending the god emperors. We've experimented at Dresden with the creation of a firestorm. At Tokyo, we turn the city away from the imperial palace. We are scrupulous not to bomb that as careful as we can be. We create a firestorm in a different part of Tokyo. Tokyo's immense. Less immense after these attacks. In this context, a recommendation of Albert Einstein to President Roosevelt from five years ago comes to the fore. Einstein wrote to Roosevelt saying that advances in science made possible the development of a new kind of weapon, an atomic bomb. The United States had become the refuge of the best scientists in Western Europe, and Britain, and the United States, including Enrico Fermi, who under the basketball court at the University of Chicago develops the world's first atomic pile, a critical mass of radioactive materials that becomes almost self-perpetuating. So the Manhattan Project is established. The man who built the largest office building and building in the world, Pentagon, is put in charge of these scientists. But these scientists don't think like soldiers. So one of the scientists, a scientist named J. Robert Oppenheimer, is placed in charge of the other scientists. And the general, Leslie Groves, is in charge of Oppenheimer. The Manhattan Project is sited out in the deserts of New Mexico, where there's going to be no contact with the outside. Security is important. We actually make sure that the janitorial staff is illiterate. We don't want people who can read and write. Massive security measures are kept because this could be the biggest secret of the war. Of course, these scientists were infiltrated by Klaus Fuchs and other Soviet spies. Stalin was informed step by step by our prog about our progress with the atom bomb. Hitler was trying to build an atom bomb, but luckily many of the scientists who were captured by him intentionally thwarted his efforts leading German research into what is called heavy water experiments, which was a dead end towards creating an atomic bomb. The Manhattan Project, in the spring of early, uh, late spring, early summer of 45, is ready to test their first implosion explosion device. You have a bunch of chemical explosives surrounding a critical, uh, potential critical mass of radioactive fissile material and you impact it from all sides, creating that critical mass and creating an atomic explosion. Uranium and plutonium are the means by which we use this. This is splitting the atom, fission. Now there is a theoretical possibility that nuclear fission could ignite the entire atmosphere. It's a small chance. But it's beyond theoretical. It is a small, unlikely, practical possibility that when we tack, uh, test the atom bomb, the Earth's atmosphere will burn all of its oxygen out and everyone will die everywhere. Who depends on oxygen? You know, losers. At Alamogordo, New Mexico, an experiment codenamed Trinity sees the detonation of our first atomic bomb. It doesn't ignite the atmosphere. However, it's so hot that it creates a mushroom cloud, a distinctive cloud because of the hunger of the fire for air. It sucks it in from below so much and pushes the heat up and creates this mushroom effect. 
As he gazed upon it through lead-lined glasses from an underground shelter, Oppenheimer quoted the Hindu scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, the words of the destroyer god, Shiva. I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. As he gazed upon the first man-made atomic explosion in the history of the earth, where we will leave things is the question of what to do with this weapon. The Germans have already been defeated. Do we use it? We've got enough for a few more bombs, enough radioactive material. What do we do? And we will leave it there. Questions, comments, or thoughts? Yes? What's the difference between the Navy and the Navy? The Navy is the American military force that commands warships above, on, and below the, the oceans. Uh, the Navy's purpose is to control the seas. The Marines work for the Navy. They are the Navy's miniature army. Marines are captured, carried on naval warships, and Marines are used by the Navy to take land targets. Marines are actually older than the United States Army and that they were formed uh, as a national unit uh, very early in our history, during the Revolution. Marines tend to be tougher than soldiers, but less well-equipped, and there are very, very few of them. So they're an elite force. Yeah. So it seems like there's a lot of contributing factors as to why Hitler was um, uh, eventually defeated, but if you had to summarize in like one sentence the biggest reason why he was, what would that be? The hubris of ne the nemesis of hubris. What made Hitler successful was that he was bold, that he dared. He dared do things no one else would do, and he was ruthless in the pursuit of this. This made him the leader of the Nazi party. This made him the leader of Germany. This made him somebody who'd been able to bluff the Allies again and again into giving him concessions. But a person who makes their living by bluffing and daring and doing the impossible can't stop. How do you know when enough is enough? The whole concept of enough being enough is to it is anathema to you. Nothing is impossible. It's like Alexander the Great. Nothing is impossible until his army almost rebels in India. So Hitler uh, causes the war in thirty nine. He didn't expect to. He expected the British never to go to war with him, but the British did, and now we have. Hitler not able to take Britain, but go after the Soviet Union. So again and again, as time goes on, Hitler's daringness works against him. Okay. You asked. There are many reasons. That's one of them. Good question. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good day. You as well. Yes.